Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of Christine by Stephen King. So, novel about a haunted car. I've been meaning to get to this for ages, and I finally picked it up as part of a job lot of Stephen King books, where there, I think there were three that I hadn't read. And, um... It's obviously one of his more well-known ones, I suppose, and I've just never seen it in a charity shop. It's also interesting because I read, um, what's it called? I read Dance Macabre, which is like King's History of Horror. And in that, he was writing about no one's ever written a haunted car novel. And obviously since then, he wrote Christine and From a Buick 8. Uh, From a Buick 8 sucked, to be honest, but Christine was better. I'm gonna read you the blurb, then I'm gonna go through, through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end, so. Dane reads. Christine was eating into his mind, burrowing into his unconscious. That night I had a dream again, only in this one Christine was old. No, not just old, she was ancient. A terrible hulk of a car, something you'd expect to see in a tarot pack. Instead of the hanged man, the death car. The engine roared and missed and jetted filthy blue oil smoke. It wasn't empty. Roland D. LeBay was lolling behind the wheel. His eyes were open, but they were glazed and dead. Each time the engine revved and Christine's rust-eaten body vibrated, he flopped like a rag doll. His peeling skull nodded back and forth. Christine, blood red, fat and thinned, was twenty. Her promise lay all in her past. Greedy and big, she was Arnie's obsession, a 58 Plymouth Fury, broken down but not finished. There was still power in her, a frightening power that leaked like some oil, staining and corrupting, a malign power that corroded the mind and turned ownership into possession. So, let's check out some of the tabs. So this here in the prologue I thought was interesting. Um, I couldn't really tell him he was full of shit because he wasn't. It was Arnie I thought at first because Arnie knew how to maximise rainy days just like he knew how to maximise Scrabble scores. Maybe that's one of the ways you recognise really lonely people. They can always think of something neat to do on rainy days. You can always call them up. They're always home. Fucking always. So we meet Roland D. LeBay who is the previous owner of Christine who kind of becomes the antagonist as well. He's talking about when he got her he goes Brand new she was, had the smell of a brand new car, and that's about the finest smell in the world, he considered. Except maybe for pussy. All right, Roland. Creepy old man alert. And he talks about Arnie's dad, Michael. Sometimes he made me think of what Ringo Starr was supposed to have said when the Beatles first came to America, and some reporter at a press conference asked him if he was really as sad as he looked. No, Ringo replied, it's just me face. I get that a lot as well. And he talks about how when you're a parent, as soon as you have a kid, you know for sure you're gonna die. When you have a kid, you see your own gravestone. Uh, they had a cat called Captain Beefheart. Um, my friend Dave's really into Captain Beefheart, very sort of idiosyncratic musician. And we get a reference to um, uh, the, the car has a flat tire and they say, it's only flat on the bottom, Arnie, right? And that's the kind of joke that my dad makes. I've actually heard him make that specific joke, I think. And a great line, if being a kid is about learning how to live, then being a grown-up is about learning how to die. We get this kind of awkward line here where the main character is, he hugs his sister. Um, Elaine really did get mad and tried to hit me and asked me, why do you always have to be so awful, Dennis? So I told her, yes, it was true you could like farts and advised her not to try it. And then I gave her a hug, which I rarely did anymore. It made me uncomfortable since she started to get boobs and so did the tickling to tell the truth. And then I went to bed. And some more great lines here. Love is the old slaughterer. Love is not blind. Love is a cannibal with extremely acute vision. Love is insectile. It is always hungry. Uh, another really interesting line, which is especially interesting when you think that King was an alcoholic and a drug user. There is a great outcry about drugs in the schools now, and I don't oppose that outcry because I think it's obscene to think of children 15 and 16 years old reeling around full of dope. But I still believe alcohol is the most vulgar, dangerous drug ever invented, and it is legal. Um, and here, this is sort of King's take on high school culture, so he says, I walked down the hall thinking about Lee Cabo and how it would pretty much stand everyone on their ear if they started going out together. High school society is very conservative, you know. No big lecture, but it is. The girls all wear the latest nutty fashions. The boys sometimes wear their hair most of the way down to their assholes. Everyone is smoking a little dope or sniffing a little coke. But all of that is just the outward pattern of the defense you put up while you try and figure out exactly what's happening with your life. It's like a mirror what you use to reflect sunlight back into the eyes of teachers and parents, hoping to confuse them before they can confuse you even more than you already are. At heart, most high school kids are about as funky as a bunch of Republican bankers at a church social. There are girls who might have every album Black Sabbath ever made, but if Ozzy Osbourne went to their school and asked one of them for a date, that girl, and all of her friends, would laugh herself into a hemorrhage at the very idea. And our main character, uh, Dennis, I think his name is, he gets, uh, he gets, he gets a nut shot, so he gets... Um, if you're a man and you've slammed your nuts a good one at some point, and what man has not, you know. If you're a woman, you don't, can't. 
The initial agony is only the start. It fades to be replaced by a dull, throbbing feeling of pressure that coils in the pit of the stomach. And what that feeling says is, Hi there, good to be here. Just sitting around in the pit of your stomach and making you feel like you're going to simultaneously blow lunch and shit your pants. I guess I'll just hang around for a while, okay? How does half an hour or so sound? Great. Getting your nuts squeezed is not one of life's great thrills. Uh, each of the chapters as well, it's kind of a bit like June, they have little quotes going into them, usually song lyrics. So chapter 18 here, on the bleachers. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches, I must make amends. Janis Joplin, great tune. Another one here, where, um, get chapter 23, Arnie and Lee. Riding along in my automobile, my baby beside me at the wheel. I stole a kiss at the turn of a mile, my curiosity running wild. Cruising and playing the radio with no particular place to go, Chuck Berry. Uh, and there's also a reference to Dion singing Run Around Sue, which is a cracking tune. And that's one of the things about Christine is the radio always gets the oldies station. And a reference to uh, Big Bopper singing Chantilly Laced as, as well, which is a great song. Uh, and then Richie Valens comes on doing La Bamba. Um, and there's basically a reference to how these are all the musicians who died in the plane crash with Buddy Holly. And um, the news comes on in Christine, and again, it's picking up like the oldies. So it says, Eisenhower predicted at the AFL-CIO convention, a future of labor and management marching harmoniously into the future together. Dave Beck had denied that the Teamsters Union was a front for the rackets. Rock and roller Eddie Cochran had been killed in a car crash while en route to London's Heathrow Airport. Three hours of emergency surgery had failed to save his life. The Russians were rattling their ICBMs. WDIL played the oldies all week long, but on the weekends they really got dedicated. 50s newscasts, wow. They're talking about how at school things get a little bit lax on the run up to Christmas. Book reports were turned in late and often bore a suspicious resemblance to jacket copy. After all, how many sophomore English students are apt to call The Catcher in the Rye this burning classic of post-war adolescence? And Darnell, who runs the kind of used car lot where uh, Christine is parked, he uses a great phrase. If they look hot, tell them to take a flying fuck at a rolling donut. And some of the students, some of the ones who bullied Arnie, who owned Christine, Christine sort of starts to drive herself, basically. Uh, a bit like in Driven, um, by Dane Cobain. Uh, but anyway, uh, some, some, some of them get found dead, and here we get, the news struck particularly hard at Libertyville High School. The young always have the greatest difficulty accepting unpleasant intelligence of their own mortality. Perhaps the holiday season made it that much harder. And Don Vandenberg is reading a very interesting sounding book. Don Vandenberg sat behind the desk inside the office of his father's gas station. Both his feet and his pecker were up. He was reading one of his father's foot books, a deeply incisive and thought-provoking tomb titled Swap Around Pammy. Pammy had gotten it from just about everyone but the milkman and the dog, and the milkman was coming up the drive and the dog was lying at her feet when the bell dinged, signalling a customer. We get a reference to Ezra Pound as well, um, who was a fascist, and we're learning about the effects of alcohol, and again this is King right from experience here. Arnie went over to the stove and began shaking the pan where the corn was picking up speed. I let a couple of swallows of beer slide down my throat. Beer was still a fairly new thing to me then, and I had never been drunk on it because I liked the taste quite well, and friends, Lenny Barong was the chief of them, had told me that if you got falling down, standing up, ralphing down your shirt shit-faced, you couldn't even look at the stuff for weeks. Sadly, I have found out since that this isn't completely true. And that's about all I want to share with you, really. I think any more than that, and I'll be getting into spoiler territory. But yeah, it's a cracking little novel about this sort of... I guess haunted car, it's not really haunted, that's not really the quite the right word for it. Um, but it definitely has this sort of creeping sense of dread, so it starts out a little bit slowly. Really the first half is more about the, the, the evils of people, and then the second half kind of goes into the more sort of supernatural stuff. Um, but yeah, there's some really good stuff in here. I did enjoy Christine, I gave it a, you know, 4 out of 5, reasonably strong, neither, neither hot or cold there on that. And I uh, would recommend it, especially if you're a King fan, and it's definitely better fr uh, than From a Buick 8. So there we have it, that's what I made of Christine. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye